So um, the continental margin is the edge of the continent, where the continent communicates with the ocean. Remember, the ocean floor is made of basalt. The continental crust is made of what? Ten points if you can tell me what the continental crust is made of. Amy, don't eat. What's that made of? Ten points. The ocean floor is made of basalt. What's the continental crust made of? Pink got it right. Would you like to see the camera? Green got it right. Did you watch the old video? Purple got it right. White got it right. What? Peach got it right. And orange got it right. Granite. So granite is lighter than basalt, so granite sticks up higher. So you don't have it where you just reel high up on granite and then it falls straight down to the basalt. There is a transition zone. Okay? And you need to learn these parts. So you have the continental shelf. That's kind of the edge of the continent where it very gradually starts going down. Well, it depends where you are. Where we are, the continental shelf is very wide. And it's a gradual slope going from where we are on the beach out to the edge of the continental <coughs> shelf. Any deep sea fishermen in here? Sometimes. You ever go down to the, out to the Gulf Stream? <coughs> how, how far is that? Like 50 miles. 50, 60, yeah, 70 60 miles. miles. That's, that's all continental shelf you're over. So if you want the little fish, that's where they are. But the big fish are real deep, see? And uh, you need to go out past that. And, and where we are, it's a long way to the uh, edge of the continental shelf. Where we are, the continental shelf is real wide. But in a place like Miami or the coast of California, the, uh, the continental shelf is not very wide. There's not much room there. So you, you, sometimes you don't have to go that far Sorry. until you get to the continental slope. Now the continental slope, it's, it's a lot steeper there. And that's where the granite starts falling off and uh, you make this transition to the basalt. And um, sediment will go rolling down and um, form what we call the continental rise, which is, uh, is less steep than the continental slope. So um, this is the steepest part, and then you get a little less steep. And then you reach the, this part right here at the bottom of the ocean is called the abyssal plain. And um, so shelf, slope, rise, so the, the slope is the steepest, rise, and then abyssal plain. And the abyssal plain, like it said in the video, if you watch that Drain the Oceans video, the abyssal plain is the largest area that we have on our planet. It, most of the ocean, it's real vast, big, long, it's pretty flat unless you get some sort of a, a volcanic activity that rises up islands and such. The abyssal plains are these long, flat stretches of, of the bottom of the ocean. So, there's a pretty cool video showing um, what this looks like on the coast of Australia taken with... Um, uh, readings, uh, sonar readings, and put to music. <coughs> Well, the abyssal plain is, it, it, it 
it's some places are shallower than others, so they're going to go light blue and dark blue. <coughs> I like how'd you, that. How'd you feel about that video, Trav? I like it. That was a cool, peaceful video. Now, we call some continental mar margins passive margins, and some continental margins active margins. Passive margins are where the con where all these uh, the shelf and the slope and the rise is gradual. It's very <coughs> gradual on a passive margin. We are at a passive margin right here on the coast of Georgia, and we just get a very gradual. It's real wide and gradual until you get out to the edge of it. You're way offshore when you actually get past the slope and rise to the abyssal plains way out here. But uh, we call it passive because we don't have, this is not where plates are interacting and one plate is diving under another. You don't have volcanoes at passive margins. You don't have trenches at passive margins. Um, you don't have earthquakes at passive margins. We have relatively little activity at our margins. And um, so they're passive. On the other side, over here, we call that an active margin. Another plate, one plate is diving under another, or plates are going past one another, and you have uh, a lot of activity. You have earthquakes and volcanoes and trenches and activity. So they call that an active margin. This this is just showing they have colored all the passive margins, and they. They uh, classify passive margins in different ways. You can have it completely passive. Sometimes it'll be passive, but we'll have some volcanic activity. Um, uh, some, this one, where we are, it says uncertain volcanic, volcanic passive margins. So we could have some volcanic activity here, but not much. Um, so. The reason why we have passive margins, like I said, is because of the way the plates are. So let's try to figure out what this is showing here. Can you all <coughs> tell that's, that's the United States right there? Yes. And that's where we are right there on the coast? Okay. All right. We make up this whole plate. Look how big our plate is, the North American plate. We were <coughs> on a big plate, y'all. Is that the biggest plate? No, you're Asian. Uh, yeah, it looks like Eurasia is probably there. Um, but you can see where we are, we're not at the edge of the plate. We're kind of in the middle of the plate. Our plate not only consists of continental crust, it consists of oceanic crust. And the middle of the plate is way out here in the, I mean the edge of the plate, is way out here in the middle of the Atlantic. So we are so far away from where the plates are colliding, that, that's why we have a passive margin. Not much is happening. <coughs> Go back over here where the uh, Pacific plate is interacting with our plate. There's movement along back and forth, and that's why there's all these earthquakes in California, and um, that's an active margin right there. So passive versus active <coughs> has to do with the way the plates are set up. Is that its own plate right in between there? Like the this yeah. little thing? Yeah. Yeah, the cocos plate. Yeah. And that plate's moving and interacting. It causes earthquakes and stuff. I went and hung out right there. You know what's right there? Galapagos. The Galapagos. Yeah. It's right on a plate boundary. It's also on a hot spot. <coughs> And so it's a really, really active area. Are hot spots only on plate boundaries? No. Between them? No, they could be anywhere. Like the, uh, the Hawaiian hot spots right there are right in the middle of the Pacific plate. So it's kind of good to look at this and get an idea of what's going on. Now, the next part of the chapter is talks about what's on the abyssal plain. 
The abyssal plain again is the bottom of the ocean. And it stretches for hundreds and hundreds of miles. If you were walking along here, you'd just be a tiny dot, and you'd be like, oh, this is so boring. And then you'd be walking along, you'd be going, why am I at the bottom of the ocean? This is so weird. And then, whoa, you come to this big Gaia, or this big sea mount. It's like a mountain in the middle of the ocean. <coughs> and you'd be like, sweet, something new. And uh, there's two different... Two different reasons. A seamount is like a mountain under the ocean, and they're produced by volcanic activity. And uh, a hot spot may have been under that thing at one point, bubbling up liquid hot magma, and um, pushed up this this seamount. It's like a mountain in the ocean. And the thing is, the, it's called a seamount if it never goes above the, the water line. If it goes above the water line, you know what we call it? Island. An island. But if it stays below the water line, we call it a seamount. That's the only difference. It's an island that never made it above the water. Pretty cool, huh? Will all seamounts eventually make it above? No, not necessarily, because they could be over a hot spot, and the hot spot could be shooting up magma and create this seamount, and then the hot spot can go dead, and, and the seamount only gets so big. See what I'm saying? So, um, sometimes the seamount does push above the ocean and becomes an island. Imagine if this thing went above the water and became an island, and then what if the island eroded? from wave action and wind and all that stuff, it erodes the top of the island. Then you get something that looks like this. We call this a guyote. And it's flat on the top. Why is it flat? Because that's the part that eroded away. <coughs> and often what will happen with these mountains underwater is they'll subside. Can you say subside? Subside. All at the same time. Subside. Much better. Hi, everyone. Sorry for the interruption. Ashland of the TV Spirit Quest will now be leaving today at 4.15. Thank you. Sweet. Okay, let's imagine this. Here's the surface of the water. Here's the bottom of the ocean. Here's our growing seamount because there's lava coming up from the bottom, pushing it up. I wish I had a red, uh-oh. Varsity cheerleaders, you obviously not need to be in this early now since the spirit flex won't be waiting until 4.15. Thank you. That sucks. Well, that sucks. Well, <coughs> need a red marker. Anybody see a red one? Um, okay, well, imagine lava is pushing up and pushing up this seamount and pushing it up. And eventually, up, oh, it, it gets above the water. Now we have an island like Hawaii or something like that. And then that island erodes. The waves break it down and, and break it off. The waves have a lot of power, and, and they can kind of scour out the edges of this. And this thing can erode and erode. And then you end up with something just below the water line that, ha that has a flat top. So... What will happen, what often happens with these big mountains under the ocean is they subside, they sink. And this thing will start sinking down. And the reason why it does that is because this is real heavy. This is a big structure. And there was lava down here pushing up. But all that lava will sometimes get used up, will come out of the volcano, and you'll be left with not much down here. And the, the weight of this thing kind of pushes down, and the whole thing sinks. It'll sink at a few inches a year sometimes, three or four inches a year. Well, if it sunk at three or four inches a year, how far would it sink in a thousand years? Pretty good bit, right? So 10,000 years, 100,000 years. Well, pretty soon this thing's might have sank a mile down or two miles down, and you end up with something that's deep underwater, a sunken Gaia. That's what they call it, a Gaia. Isn't that cool? Yes. There's all kinds of marine life that lives around these things. Because a fish doesn't just like 
to swim out here in the open ocean. Um, it might get eaten, it's easy to see. So they like to go into places like this where there's a bunch of cracks and crevices that they can hide in, they can lay their eggs in, um, they, they can be feel safer in. So we get all types of sea life with these sea mounts and guyotes. Let's watch a video on it. Make the water clear and beneath the surface are sea mounts. Isolated mountains rising from the ocean floor. The waters above sea mounts are alive with ocean predators. And by lighting the ocean depths, we can see why. Sea mounts disrupt the smooth flow of the currents. As the water moves past the massive bulk of the mountain, it behaves in a strange way. A spinning donut of water, a vortex forms above the summit. At the center of the donut, a downward jet of water carries plankton down onto the summit, which feeds many different creatures, from corals and sponges, because they got little algae living with them 
in the algae do photosynthesis and help feed the corals. It's like a symbiotic relationship. We're going to do a lot more on coral later. Coral is, is big in marine biology. So anyway, these corals are just living here like this. And what will happen is that, in some cases, the entire island will subside. What's subside mean? <coughs> sink it down. Sink. The whole, what if the whole island starts to sink? Well, these corals, what they'll do is they'll just keep growing upward as the island sinks. And so what you end up getting, let me go to the next picture here. Here you have your volcanic island stuck above water. And uh-oh, uh now it starts to sink. And the white that you see around the edge, that's the coral. The coral is thriving on the edge. Well, as the mountain's sinking, the coral keeps growing upward because the coral can, can grow at a certain rate. The coral can grow an inch or two taller a year. And so if the, if the mountain is sinking at an inch or two a year and the coral is growing at an inch or two a year, you know, what you'll get is a, is a wider and wider area of coral. Continue this on, mountain sinks, coral grows, and the mountain eventually sinks down and you've got a bunch of coral on the edges and not much in the center because it's been growing like crazy on the edges the whole time, not in the middle where it was land before. And so you'll get this ring of coral the on the outside and just kind of a lagoon in the middle. <coughs> a lagoon underwater? A lagoon is just a bunch of water. Yeah. I mean, oh, that's above water. Yeah, yeah. This is, yeah, this is the surface of the water. Yeah, nice. Now it's cool, the, the guy who first suggested this was how atolls formed was Charles Darwin. He did his Galapagos voyage and came up with his theory of evolution and all that. He also came up with the idea of coral atolls. That's something that not hardly, no one, it, very few people know about that, that he can't, he figured out how coral atolls form. And he was right. They figured it out now that, that that's how they form. So uh, it's great to go diving at these atolls because it can be really deep around the thing, but you pull your boat up, and now you got this shallow, and sometimes the, uh, the edges of this are still above the water and form a little coral island. And, uh, and you can hang out on this little coral island and then dive and do, you know, look at all the coral, and it's, it's shallow and it's really pretty. And so you take a lot, of, a lot of dive trips go to these atolls. So is the inside isolated from the outside? Yeah, the inside is cut off, yeah. And, and the conditions there are different than the outside conditions. Usually the water here is less salty because rainfall kind of collects there. And the water out here is more salty and um, the conditions are different. But you can see uh, at this one, that's land. That's, that's a coral <coughs> island right there. It's actually above. It's dead coral. And it's actually above the edges. And, uh, and you could, you know, you could have a little, that's a little beach there. You could have a little beach and a picnic and whatever. And, dive and look at the coral and different types of coral on the inside than there are on the outside and atolls are really cool. It's good good for marine biology, good study in the life of video footage of atolls. Can you say atoll? Atoll. atoll. Across the world, from Australia to the shores of Belize, coral reefs come in different shapes and sizes. One type of reef, most often found in the Pacific Ocean, tells a fascinating story about evolution and geologic time. It's called an atoll. When we say time, we mean big time. It can take up to 30 million years to create an atoll. Here's how it happens. An atoll begins with an underwater volcano called a seamount. As it erupts, it spills lava, which hardens as it meets the water. Over time, in many eruptions, the seamount grows until it rises above water. Now, it's officially an island. As the centuries tick by, the volcano goes down. 
Underwater, the hardened lava becomes a home for all sorts of creatures, including corals. As the corals grow, they form a fringing reef around the island. Fringing reefs grow directly from shore. They're the most common type of reefs. Over time, the reef continues to evolve. The island, this dormant volcano, can start sinking, weighed down by the heavy reef and rock. As the island sinks, the corals remain, growing upwards. Eventually, a wide band of water called a lagoon forms between the reef and the land. The fringing reef has become a barrier reef. Millennia keep spinning by. The extinct volcano is now completely submerged, but the corals are still growing. As they break the surface of the water, they die and their stony skeletons turn into sand and rubble mixed with coral and algae. Now, a coral rim surrounds a central lagoon. The reef has changed yet again into an atoll. When there are gaps in the coral rim, the surrounding ocean flows in and out of the lagoon. And each one of them builds a little shell around itself. But they live in huge colonies. So living on this little rock, this is called brain coral, by the way. Doesn't it look like a brain? Um, you can look, when I pass it around, you can look and see little holes. The corals live in those little holes, and they live in big groups. And so I'm, there might be 10,000 corals here, each of them building a little shell around themselves. So you end up with a big, heavy thing that's like a rock. So coral is like rock almost around the water, around the <coughs> islands, and with these little creatures that stick out and feed. They have little tentacles, and they'll stick their tentacles out and they'll feed, and then they'll go back in at night into their shell and just sit there. Um, uh, actually, they go back, they go in in the day and sit there, and they come out at night to feed. So um, there's algae that live with them, doing this. Uh, so coral is an animal. Coral is an animal, that's correct. Yeah. It's related to a jellyfish. Here you go, you can pass that one that way. You pass those the other way. They're little holes that they live in. So that's those are atolls. Atolls are cool. Anyone here ever dive in an atoll? No scuba diving? I've done some snorkeling in an atoll, but I've never, I, I, don't, I don't have a dive. Don't draw that up. Where did you acquire this coral? That was here when I got here. Uh, they get 25 years ago. Isn't coral illegal to like buy? Yeah, you're not supposed to like take it because the reefs are all gradually disappearing. Uh, so they don't want people to take it. But 
if a piece washed up on shore somewhere, you could probably take it. I don't know. The next thing, uh, the last thing I want to talk about today is a um, a uh, <coughs> uh, these black smokers, these um, little chimneys at the bottom of the ocean uh, that have water that <coughs> comes up out of them, and um, they're located. Uh, these these black smokers are located all along the um, middle of the ocean. Let's see if I have a map here. Right along where the, where the, the center of the Atlantic here, the plates are all separating and going in opposite directions. And if you look along the bottom of the ocean there, you have these black smokers, which look like that little thing there, this this is a, there's too much information on this. No. We're not interested in everything that's on there. <coughs> but we're interested in these little, birds. these little chimney-like structures. That water, what happens is water seeps in to the, uh, to the rock at the bottom of the ocean floor and goes down here and gets near the liquid hot magma that you can see is 1200 degrees Celsius, very hot. And water will seep through cracks in the ocean floor and get heated up and come spewing out of these cracks in the center of the mid ocean ridge. And will form these little chimneys that are called black smokers. And the reason why they call them black smokers is the water that comes out of these things is filled with minerals that have been picked up as the water does this long route through the cracks in the rock. It picks up all these minerals and they come shooting out of these little black smokers. They never knew about these things Why doesn't it evaporate? until about 30 years ago. What's that? This looks like a brain. Yeah, it's called brain coral. <laughs> Why doesn't it evaporate if it's like 1,200 degrees Celsius? Because it's underwater, and evaporation only happens when you turn oh, like the gas top. in the air. So this is all this is all underwater, high pressure, um, in the rock, high pressure. And there's nowhere to evaporate to. And here we go, these these black smokers shooting up all these all this high mineral water. And there's all kinds of creatures that use the the chemicals that come out of the ocean, there's a lot of sulfur in it, and they use those, these creatures use those chemicals to live and multiply. And there's all these giant worms, tube worms, and uh, it's a very neat landscape there at the bottom of the ocean. Is that chemosynthesis? Oh, chemosynthesis, yep, yep. Watch a video of these guys. Oh, come on. They're called hydrothermal vents. <coughs> Mm-hmm. 